So hi, Paul, and welcome to this episode of the Curiosity Key podcast. Thank so you, I've already you. said hi, Paul. Um, <laughs> we're off to a good start here. Um, now, we met uh, in, oh, when did we meet? I think we met in person mm. in February, but we met February. online quite a while ago, didn't we? That's right. Yeah, yeah. The B1G1 conference in London, yeah. Yes. And this is a perfect follow-up episode because we had um, the interview with Paul Dunn from B1G1 last week as a mutual friend and mentor of ours. Um, so I'm absolutely thrilled to have you on the podcast this week. I'm really so, happy to be here. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, about yourself and your background? Because um, we're going to talk today a little bit about a purpose-driven business and also how you can leverage technology to add more meaning to your work. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself and, and how that all fits together. Okay, so I run a company called Remote alongside my wife, Jeannie. And we started that company back in September 1999. So we've been going a while now. We build custom software for purpose-driven teams. So what I mean by that is that we build software that helps teams to get scale up, to amplify their impact, to do more in the world. Um, systems that kind of take the workload off people so that they can do the work they were born to do. And we prefer to work for people that are doing good in the world. Um, the idea is that if we help people that are doing good in the world, then that's us doing good in the world too. That's, our, that's the way that we do our thing. That's amazing. So can you share any examples of how um, businesses are using technology and software to do more good in the world or to amplify um, the meaning in their work? Mm, yeah, sure. So let me think. One of our long-term clients, a company called Cellpath, we built a system for them. I'll rewind a tiny bit. So they, are, they archive cellular samples. So basically, every time you go to a doctor or a hospital and give a biological sample of any type, blood, whatever, then EU law says that you have to store that sample for your lifetime plus 30 years. So as you can imagine, that law has been around for a while. Hospitals full up of samples and they needed somewhere to offload the samples. It's, it's, it's important work. They need to keep these samples because if uh, a few years down the line something happens and you need to go to the doctor and they need to refer back to a previous sample, the doctor needs that sample back as, as quick as humanly possible so that they can make a, a, a quick diagnosis. Right. So, cell path. They came to us when they had they built a, gi a giant warehouse and half filled it with cellular samples and realized that Microsoft Office wasn't going to do it for them. They needed something that would help as they scaled for them to know exactly where any sample was. These samples are tiny slides, like you know, a few millimeters thick, and, and they've got millions and millions of them. Wow. And they need to know where any, any of those slides were, and they need to be able to retrieve it back within 24 hours. So um, it's, it's kind of an abstract doing good in the world, but it's, it's essential work, you know, they're saving lives. So they came to us with a half full warehouse and we built them a system and we continue to develop it in increments, ongoing work, nine or 10 years later, they're now talking about building their fifth warehouse that will be 20 meters tall and they filled the other four. Uh, wow. And our system still can find slides within 24 hours and we're constantly improving. And it's amazing, they got, a, they got something like 53% improvement in how fast they could archive these samples within three months of using the first iteration of the software. So that's a, that's a good data storage kind of, kind of thing that we do. That's amazing. So I, think, I guess it's um, with software, there's a lot of manual processes that are going on and, uh, you know, you can streamline a lot of that to then free up your time to do things, like you said, that add more meaning to your work and actually be able to make a, a bigger impact in the world. Um, so what are your thoughts on, um, you know, various people that are saying, you know, software, robots and automated systems are kind of replacing a lot of the jobs and the manual jobs that people are having? Uh, because personally, I don't agree with this, but I'm keen to hear your thoughts around that. Yeah, so I do agree with it. I think they are replacing jobs and they, I think they're going to be replacing swathes of jobs. But what might be controversial is that I think that's a great thing. So I think, yeah, reason, that, that's what I meant. I, I'm with you. They are replacing jobs, but I think that, that there's a lot of new jobs being created as a result. Yes, there's, there's, um, we know already that I, I think it's something stupid like 66% of children at school now um, or going into school now will be doing, will be having careers that don't exist yet when they leave school. 
Um, so yes, there'll be lots of jobs created. Now, some people have said that the number of jobs created by artificial intelligence and automation isn't the same number as the number of jobs that will be uh, replaced by artificial intelligence and automation. But the reason I think this is a good thing is because if a job can be automated, if it's to quote Mariam Page, simple, logical, repeatable, if it's so simple, logical and repeatable that a robot can do it, then really should we be spending our lives doing that? So it's kind of like, I think there's going to be a big upheaval. It's already starting, right? We're going to get a big upheaval and jobs will be displaced. But the jobs that people will go into as a result of that displacement will be the jobs that use the human parts of us, the creative, the, the connecting, the, um, the compassionate parts of us that a robot can't replace. And call me an idealist, but I, I, I feel that that's the future. I feel that, that because of the power of uh, automation, because of the power of robotics, actually, there'll be less need for work, but that will be across the board. And so maybe we'll all be working less and the robots will be doing a lot more, which balances up the whole thing of how many jobs are replaced and how many jobs um, are, are just lost. If we all are able to lean on the robots and the automation to do our work, then we're freed up to do the really cool stuff and the really fun stuff and the real stuff that we want to do. That's my take on it. Yeah, and I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think when we were speaking uh, back in February, you know, we were talking a lot about, you know, finding meaning in our work and, you know, being very purposeful with what it is that we're doing and the mm. impact that we want to make. So why is it important to you uh, to have meaning and purpose in, in your work? Mm. So I think it's fair to say that for a good 17 years of running remote, we were running it as a business purely to make money. And we had good relationships with our clients, we still have great relationships with our clients. Um, so I didn't mean to put that in past tense, but back then it was all about do the project, deliver it, move on. And it didn't really bother us really what kind of project we were doing and what kind of impact that project was making to a certain extent. And what I found was that I, I really just, wasn't really happy. I was just, I was stressed. I would lose my temper at the slightest thing. I was just miserable. I was just, oh, what am I doing this for? What's the point? It was, I was classic Kevin the teenager. I was, <laughs> it was not good. And, you know, I, I, you probably know I got, I got very ill. Um, and, you know, I was, I was bed bound for like nine months, you know, so wow. I got myself in such a state that I triggered, I, I created trauma in myself which triggers a genetic um, predisposition to Crohn's disease and so it was like I was forced to stop and go hang on what am I doing in my life and you know that was that was the hardest hardest time for me ever it was it was awful to to actually not not be well enough to even you know work for an hour for, for some time and so when I came back into work I kind of had a new perspective on it. And I realized that I'd just been getting stressed, I'd just been unhappy. And I just I just started looking, I suppose, for how things should change. And, and Jeannie and I looked at what the business was that we had. Um, and I guess we had a, a couple of other wake-up calls. I mean, Crohn's disease is a pretty massive wake-up call for anyone. Um, but we lost a couple of key people that I thought were in it for life. Um, and I realised now that they didn't really have any meaning in the work either. It was the same thing. There was just like, for someone that's working for me, then it's easy for them to go, oh, I'll just find another job. I'll, I'll be happier there. You know, they don't need to introspect, but it's my business. I'm not going anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, so I spent a lot of time looking into that. There's, there's been a, a kind of spiritual pathway through my life and Jeannie's life. It's a big part of our life and when I say spiritual what I'm talking about is coming from the philosophy that everything is one we're all one Every, everything is is one giant universe working together 
for whatever 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 means so and science has proved this now the idea the idea of me and you being separate is actually an illusion a, a perception illusion created to help evolution um when actually there's no gap between me and you even though you're up in nottingham you know even even air is just atoms right flying at different vibrations mm-hmm. so actually there's no there's no there's no space between me you between uh, between me and anyone listening to this right so when when you really grok that and it can take some work and some real investigation to grok that the idea of doing something purely for yourself becomes a little a little empty and so you start to look outwards and you start to look at the world in a, in a way that makes you think what I'm doing here isn't affecting myself over there in a positive way. And how can I change that? There's things that need to be done. And, you know, it's, in, it's, it, it's accelerating. The things that need to be done, the things that need to be fixed in the world, it's accelerating. It's like, it feels like we're on a roller coaster going downwards and we're all screaming, going, oh my God, <laughs> climate change, politics, you know, the the drought that it's, it's, it's horrific the war and there's only so long if you're honest with yourself that you can let that go on without thinking okay what can i what can i do now i'm under no illusions that i'm gonna stop any wars um not at least for the next few years um but i think it's it's all of our duty to really look at what we can do how can we make a difference and so you know thanks to working with genie and you know the the kpi program that we we, we've talked about before a little bit before we we hit record um i think the first thing you do on the kpi program which is a business accelerator program uh the first thing you do on the very first day is to really look into what your real values are not just the the cheesy motivational poster values that you put on the wall but your, what are your actual values and so you really ask why am i doing this um the great book everyone knows uh, the simon sinek start with why book mm-hmm. i read that and it blew my mind i really realized oh my god this is you know i really need to know this why do i do this why do i do this i love computers no there's more than that um and that's where it started and that's where it, it where it's kicked off so That's did you, what, when you were sort of looking for, for that meaning, was that what prompted you to join that business accelerator or was there something else that, that prompted you to kind of seek help from a group like that? Okay, so I mentioned that um, a couple of our key employees moved away from the business and that came as a real shock because for the pr- previous, I don't know, Two, two, two years, maybe three years. I'd been recovering from the the worst of the Crohn's disease, and I was back at work. And I was like, just getting through the day was a massive victory for me. So I was blind to the fact that just getting through the day isn't a massive victory for many people. You know, many mm. people that's taken for granted. But for me, it's like, oh god, it's five o'clock. I'm still here. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah. you know? um, so I was kind of blind to this whole idea. That work needs to have any more meaning than its own its own perpetuation. I think I lost my thread a little bit. Um, what was the question again? It was more around what, what was it that prompted you to join a business accelerator? Because was that, was that the first accelerator yeah. that you joined since starting a business in 1999? Yeah, it was. Yeah. So Jeannie and I, we were we were left with it was it was just me, Jeannie, and one developer. And it was like, we're a software company and we've got one developer and we were just about to sign some big contracts. And we were like, so we really looked not only at, you know, the why thing, but also the what. And we're like, should we even be running the business? You know, at the moment, you know, he could get another job anywhere. It's brilliant. You know, do we want, what do we want to be doing? And we realized that running remote was absolutely what we wanted to be doing. We loved running remote. But we realized that we plateaued. And we realized that we'd been a team of, say, five people for a good 10 years. And we'd been doing the same level of work, turning over the same amount of money, doing the same kind of work, which was good work, you know. Um, but there was no excitement. There was no growth. There was, there was 
hardly anyone had heard, heard of us because all of our work comes from referrals. And so you get word of mouth and it's just the right amount of work coming in. You don't need to advertise. You don't need to do any networking. People in Shrewsbury, we're, in, we're based in Shrewsbury and people in Shrewsbury now are just going, what? what, you've been here how long? Oh my God, how did I not know that? So we asked ourselves one simple question. What would happen to our business if we did start to shout about it? What would happen if we did start making waves and did actually start to actually make a difference? And so I started reading frantically every business book, which I hadn't done for a good 10 years, every business book I could get my hands on. So I fell down a, an Amazon Kindle rabbit hole. So I read Martin Norbury, uh, I Don't Work Fridays. Okay. And then after I finished that and loved that, Amazon said, hey, you might like this one. It's um, Key Person of Influence by Daniel Priestley. So I thought, okay, cool, download it. Read it on the plane on the way to my brother's wedding in Miami. Absolutely loved it. Just, and he mentions, of course, it's a great sales tool for KPI. He mentions the accelerator. So I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Downloaded his sequel, um, Oversubscribed. Read that. Oh, that's a fantastic book. I read Oversubscribed oh. before I read P- Key Person of Influence and thought it was okay. absolutely, fu- yeah, I thought it was brilliant because I'm not part of the KPI uh, business accelerator, part of a different uh, business accelerator. Mm. But it's that kind of, all the businesses that I've worked for in the past and also having worked in public sector for a couple of years is that there are a lot of businesses that kind of have that mindset where it's, that's not right for us or we don't need to pay for a business accelerator or rather we don't need to invest in something like that to help us grow yet you know that was always something very important to me right from when I started my own business and I found that the more businesses I talk to that are part of these business accelerators do accelerate <laughs> you know, oh, uh, it, it doesn't take yeah. them uh, as long so it's uh, it's good to hear that you're you're benefiting because also when just before we started talking you did say that even though you're celebrating 20 years in business this year you did you do still feel like a startup yeah 100 percent. it's so and it's it, it, it's a full circle this story is a full circle really so when we started so i was well it was like 26 um and, you know, I was fresh out of college. I'd had one job. I'd worked um, in the headquarters of American Express in Brighton making credit cards. That was my only previous job. And, um, you know, a crazy combination of, of, of events meant that all of a sudden we were running a, a software development business. And I didn't know how to run a software development business. Um, and I was reading. I was just frantically reading every business book. But 1999, I'm, I think Amazon was around, but just about, you know, it was... There was, there was barely anything. So I went to Waterstones, I think, you know, to get loads of these things. And, but I did find some really good business books. And I did read for in the early period, in the startup period. And I think what I learned in that period from 99 to maybe 2001, 2002, set me off on this trajectory. Um, I'm talking about you know, Seth Godin, um, Meatball Sunday, um, that's my favourite one. Uh, purple, the Purple Cow by Seth Godin as well. Elihu Goldratt, Theory of Constraints, all of those books are just awesome. We still use that. It's just so powerful. I'm just lucky that you know, they're old books. And so they're around. Um, Ricardo Semler re- wrote a massive, massively influential book to me called Maverick, um, where he, he, he wants to be a rock star but his dad wants him to run a factory. And so out of rebellion, he quits being a rock star, but buys a ladder factory. He says, I'm going to run this ladder factory instead of my dad's factory. <laughs> I'll have to check that one out. I've not, I've not read that, but I uh, grew up around Formula One and racing driving and, you know, sort of being inspired by the likes of, you know, uh, I have to sort of mention Nicky Lauda because, you know, unfortunately he mm. passed away um, last week, which is so, so sad because he was a huge yeah. source of inspiration, you know, and he did the same as, you know, his his family wanted him to take over their business and, you know, go into a successful career in, in finance. And he was like, no, I, I want to be a racing driver. And, you know, sheer example of grit and determination. Um, Absolutely. It's, it's been surprising to me. Um how many people this week have said what a massive inspiration he was. It's, it's incredible, really. Um, it, the Formula One is, is, is slightly outside of my scope. I think I followed it once, one year, which was really exciting. But um, 
I, I haven't really followed it. So that, that's totally new to me. Oh, I hated so, sports growing up, apart from the Formula One, because my dad used to be a racing driver. Um, well, that is before, pretty good. Uh, before I was even thought about. Um, yeah. But yeah, I grew up with the Formula One and then didn't get into sports until I was 21. But for me, I learned about business and I got excited about business and leadership and management mm. through looking at sp- my sporting heroes or rather the managers, you know, being a Man United fan, a huge cycling fan. So it's like looking at Dev Brailsford and Alex Ferguson, um, mm. Clive Woodward from the rugby as well. And it's that drawing on their experience that first got me interested in it. But it's, it's always interesting to talk to other people about, you know, what, you know, because you're talking about Steph Godin and um, what's the guy's name called for Maverick? I'll have to reference that in the show notes Ric- as well. Ricardo Simler. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, and Goldratt's theory of constraints. So yeah, well, that's, that's really interesting to hear. So yeah, that, that was an inspiration. Um, I'll re- rewind about that a tiny bit in a minute, but just to finish this, this thread, that, that, was, that really, reading those books and starting off, set us off on a trajectory, and it was really exciting for a while. But then I got into the business, I felt like, well, we know how we're running this business now and we're doing it. And I stopped reading those things and I stopped learning. I never went to any courses, networking I went to, and it's like, oh, this isn't for me at all. And so it was only when we hit this kind of new rock bottom where I realized we had been plateauing, that we stepped onto the business accelerator. And you're right, you do accelerate. Being surrounded, you know, I've met people like you, um, you had Rebecca Godfrey on the show, although I've only virtually met her, but, you know, people, people in this community are people that are doing stuff. All of a sudden, it's normal to start a podcast. It's normal to write a book. It's normal to, to have these amazing automated sales lead funnels and to be speaking and in, being interviewed on all sorts of shows. When that's the new normal, you just start doing it. Mm. And that's been massive for me. And to, to, to be doing that with the support and the inspiration by, by this, this new business community that I found myself in, the B1G1 community as well, it's, you know, it's, it's a really amazing community of people. All of a sudden, we're doing these new things. My podcast comes out in, in a couple of weeks. You know, it's awesome. My book, I'm very close to first draft. Um, it's, we're doing exciting stuff. I've joined the board of directors for two new businesses this year. It's like, you know, what's that all about? Me 10 years ago, even me five years ago, would have been really confused by me now. And so, yeah, it, here in the team that we've got here, we feel like we're in a startup. We feel like that we're just starting out. Everything we're addressing anew, we're saying, okay, what is the best way of doing this? It doesn't matter about how we've been doing it for 20 years. How should we be doing it now? And what do we want to be doing? So what, uh, what advice would you give to somebody that's not hit rock bottom or not even heading there, but isn't really part of a business accelerator? They're not really feeling like they've got meaning or purpose in their work or their business and maybe a little bit curious about how to look for it but doesn't necessarily want to wait until they've hit rock bottom or think that that's going to happen <laughs> I've probably yeah. explained that in the completely uh, the wrong way about it but like basically what advice would you give to a business that is intrigued and curious about how to add more meaning and purpose in their work um mm. you know without having to go through that that process of um hitting yeah. rock bottom and then you definitely to look don't it. need to hit rock bottom you definitely <laughs> don't need to traumatize yourself so much that you develop a deadly disease it's it's that's you know i was um one of, I went to, uh, let me try that sentence in English. One of the people that helped me with my recovery was an amazing um, medical herbalist uh, called Fiona Shakila Burns. Uh, and I went to see her once a month for a few months. I went to see loads of people. You know, my wife, Jean, she's now studying herbal medicine. She's been amazing to help in my recovery. But she said something amazing as I turned one of the corners in the recovery from the illness saying recovery from the illness in itself is quite amazing considering the doctors told me that you know it's an incurable condition that i'd have for life and if i didn't take the pharmaceutical route it would kill me that's you know it's pretty amazing she said you're listening to your body now so it doesn't have to shout anymore and that's a really powerful teaching wherever you go so i wasn't listening to any of the signs that my staff were starting to feel like, what's the point? I wasn't listening to the fact that I would lose my temper at the slightest, at the drop of a hat. I wasn't losing, I wasn't recognizing that we'd even plateaued. It was, it was just, oh, this is, this is how it is now. 
I probably didn't even reflect on it. There was lots of aspects of my life that I simply didn't notice. I didn't listen to the signs, or maybe I just stubbornly ignored them. And so it's very easy to to not hit rock bottom. You just, just look around, just stop and reflect on a regular basis, and all of a sudden you can spot things way before they get out of control. So... The things I've learned on the recovery to that, that we're now implementing and that we do a lot for other businesses too, is that we tend to, when I speak to people running businesses, the thing they say to me the most in our first meeting is, oh, I know I should be doing all that, but I've got all this other admin to do. Mm -hmm. It's just constant, constant. We've even chatted about that. It's, It's like, yeah. Of, of course, I, I need to be recording this podcast interview right now. But what about the, what about the accounts? What about that email I forgot to send? What about that booking I need to make? I need to, it's on and on. You know, we all know how big our to-do lists are. And I definitely struggle with just dealing with those to-do lists over and over again for many, many years. And it's still a battle. I'm not going to pretend that I've, I've conquered this one. But I, I see where we're headed and I, I see it happening for a lot of other people. So there's kind of layers to it. The first obvious and, and quick one is out, outsourcing. Um, get, get a PA or a VA and get someone else to do it. And it feels like I definitely felt this for years, which is, yeah, but I'm the only one that really knows how to do that properly. <laughs> yeah, you hear that so much and you hear yourself saying it so much, don't you? And and I, I so i feel that i get that but the fact is having outsourced internally with my own team from starting with me and Jeannie, and now there's eight of us and within a couple of months there'll be at least 10 of us and certainly 12 or 14 of us by the end of the year i keep stepping back and keep letting someone else do that job and the thing is that if you can find someone else to do that job for whom that is their individual strengths and talents all of a sudden, those jobs aren't just been doing, being done as well as you're doing them, but they're being done well, way, way better than you could ever do them. And I've seen that now many times. And it's difficult, especially when you start on your own, to actually let go of those jobs. But when you do, it's a sense of liberation. So I do think, though, actually, I've probably done this the wrong way around, because I think before you actually give the job to someone else, there are aspects of automation that you can bring in really quickly. And so I'm talking about getting yourself organized using a board like monday.com or um, to do this like to do it is really literally a to do this, but there are, there are management systems, systems to automatically email people, plugging things into Zapier and um, using something like active campaign to monitor your sales funnels and your, your, your contacts. Um, slightly more creative if you're managing big projects you can use something as simple as base camp um, to actually make sure that people are actually talking to each other and know that they're on the same page we used jira we used jira for a long time now we use microsoft devops for managing all those kind of who's doing what and, and what are the problems with that and how do we progress and where are we at and what that does is it allows your teams to be disparate your teams can be all over the globe and Sometimes it allows you to do things without a team altogether because you're automating these processes. And it's phenomenally powerful. And it does take a process to get to how do I create these processes? Because you think, well, I just do this a particular way and I just go with my gut, really. I'm not really sure how I do this. I couldn't possibly describe it to someone else. But you could use something like Process Street, for example, which is an online process tool, which allows you to go through what I do, basically what I do is I say, okay, this is a process that I really shouldn't have to do anymore. I'm going to turn it into a process that anyone can do. And so I might hit record on a video, or I might open up Process Street straight away, or I might just note it down. And every time I do something in that step, I write down what I've done. Um, big, go on. I was going to say, so you, you've mentioned quite a lot of different tools there, a, a lot of which I'm I'm familiar with, some of which I use myself in my business and, and others, which are definitely more for a, a larger business, because I know that the companies that I've worked for in the past have used Jira over Microsoft DevOps, but then I know a lot of people that do use that. What advice would you give to somebody that is 
interested about incorporating automation to streamline their processes and better engage their teams, but doesn't necessarily know where to start because there are so many different tools out there, aren't there? Like, how do you yeah, know okay. uh, which is going to be the right tool for you? Totally. So if I step back a little bit, I was about to say the process, how to create the processes, but you're right. Where, where do we even start? So what we tell our clients to do is for two or three weeks before we have our first clarity session, which I'll walk you through, is we say every job you do, just write it down. Just keep a notepad by your desk and write down that job. Write down the time you start that job. And when you've gone to the next job, you write the time you start that. So you can see how long you spend on each job. Because what I've found is that there's some kind of weird time warp field thing going on when we're working. I'll often say to Jeannie, oh, it only took me 10 minutes. Now I look at my time sheet, it actually took me an hour and a half. And that that extrapolated out over days and weeks is, is a dramatic misperception of how we spend our time. So we write down what we do and then we can spot the things that we spend the most time on and we know in our heart which of those things we really hate doing. Um, often we say to clients to actually scale it one to ten, one being love doing this, ten being I, I would definitely pay someone else to do this if I possibly could. And then you can definitely take those things and go, okay, in fact, we did this an internal process in the office uh, just yesterday. Take all those things, you can scale them out. And what, what we actually did was got post-it notes for every single process that we did. And at the top of the wall was the post-it notes that we hated doing. At the bottom of the wall, the post-it notes that we loved doing. And we could then just skim the top of those post it notes and say, okay, how can we automate this? How can we change this process? Mm -hmm. So to answer your question directly, how to know what's right for you, it's actually very difficult because it's right for everyone. So I can't tell you specifically how, how to, but there are people online that are obsessed with this kind of thing. There are Facebook groups um, that talk about this constantly. Just... See, I go, with, I go with my gut. I look at the interface. I look at the intuition. I look at video demos. You can get a feel for it. If I type in the name of the thing I want to solve, which is maybe um, automate my mailing lists or you know, um, send reminders or hold data, re reconfigure data and send it to other people, all those kind of different stages, Google's your friend. And because by the time this podcast comes out, anything I say now will probably be out of date. <laughs> There's a really good tip on that because I just want to pick up on the fact that you just said to me, so you go into Google and you would type in the problem that you want to solve. And I see so many businesses that have incredible solutions, uh, incredible products for these problems. But because they're not communicating from the, the point of view in, in which, like, you know, our product or our service solves this particular problem um instead it's kind of a lot of businesses especially in b2b fall into this trap of talking about the the features and the benefits and you know why it was formed and uh you know very traditional marketing that doesn't actually talk about the problems that it solves you're missing out on huge opportunities to be found when people are searching for these things um so i talk a lot about clarity yeah. but that wasn't a very clear way of explaining no, i think I, I think you explained that really well there's two books that really opened my eyes to that very point. Um, first of all, Donald Miller, um, Building a Story Brand. Oh, that he's awesome. phenomenal. Yeah, I've just done his online course, actually. Oh, really? Looks yeah, um, I'd, I would have loved to travel back to Dallas to do an in-person workshop mm -hmm. because I am a big fan of Donald Miller and his Story Brand framework. So yeah, anybody listening to this, it's not just me raving on about it. It Just get story, uh, Building a Story Brand, the book by Donald Miller, sign up yeah. to his podcast, absorb everything that he talks about because it will really help you become more, more clear about what it is that you're doing. 100%. We use Story Brand on all of the um, business and customer facing websites that we build in fact is, is awesome yeah totally so that and also marcus sheridan they ask you answer yeah um you know that one too yeah of i love it because i recommend these are the two most recommended things that i talk about because i had um i saw marcus speak at social media marketing world a couple of years ago and it was one of those experiences that i like i wasn't a real big 
business book reader at that point. You know, I'd always focused on books around uh, leadership and especially around sports and leadership <laughs> because mm, sports yeah. coaching was more of a personal interest of mine. Um, and then uh, I started reading more books about uh, business marketing, social media. And it was my old boss that said, do you want to go to social media marketing world? And, you know, you go to this community where everybody's talking about, you know, oh, this person's an influencer in this. And I was like, oh, I've never heard of them before, <laughs> um, which was um, I think I, I definitely felt like I stood out like a sore thumb at that event. But I went to see Marcus Sheridan speak um, because I had uh, read about uh, him in a content marketing book and he just absolutely blew me away just from you know watching him as a speaker he just engaged the crowd and then his they ask you answer book what was weird was it was all it's so obvious isn't it yeah like totally. everything that he writes is so obvious and actually what I found was I was applying some of those techniques in the marketing that I was doing which is completely unaware of it and they were actually the marketing techniques that worked the best Amazing. So Amazing. for me reading that, I was just like, oh, you know what? I, maybe I'm not that thick after all, <laughs> you know, and I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> but yeah, no, Marco well, showed it is, um, yeah, I, I love that guy. He's amazing. Totally. Yeah. What I love about this whole business journey is that we definitely, after a while, you intuit what's working and you can see what's working. So a whole, um, you have a whole sort of iterative process on developing your business. You know, it's like learning to skateboard up a pole. You'll fall over hundreds and hundreds of times until you work out the balance quite right and then you'll do it. Not that I've ever managed that, but, you know. <laughs> um, but those books, they save you, they save you those years of, of experimentation. They just say, actually, mm. just, just do it like this. Uh, yeah, totally. And again, that's what I love about KPI. Just do what Dan says. I think it's a phrase, you know, because he's worked it out. He's done it. I will include, I'll include a link to uh, KPI in the show notes because, uh, you know, we've had uh, Rebecca Godfrey on, um, on the podcast before. We've had um, Rick, um, my, my brain has gone completely back, Rick uh, from Neurocore. Uh, he's also part of uh, KPI. Um, I don't know Paul Dunn as well. Like a lot of people well. in the B1G1 community are part of KPI. And, yeah. you know, I, I've met so many people part of this program that, everybody raves about it so yeah just if you're interested go check it out for sure um yeah, absolutely. But yeah. yeah definitely so yeah natalie jameson as well she was yes she was on yeah yeah and so, that's what I love, I think, as well, processes. because it's all about building communities, isn't it? You know, you go, you can you can meet new and interesting people uh, that you can collaborate with, that you can talk about, that will lift you up. Because uh, it's always one of my favourite Jim Rohn quotes, which is that you are the average of the top five people you spend the most time with. And when you join these business accelerators and coaching programmes, um, you just spend time with these inspirational people that you know will give you ideas and lift you up and give you the advice um and you can use linkedin for it as well like if you're not part of one of these groups and you do want advice as to what to incorporate in your business or how to solve a problem post post it on linkedin ask your community to give you advice based on their experiences um and it's a really quick quick way to to do it definitely that sense of that sense of support that you get from that kind of community is astounding for your confidence you know it's just not just like advice on how to do it. You know, someone in KPI community taught me how to uh, set up my podcast and do all the, someone else in the KPI community set me, uh, set me up with video skills and that kind of thing. It's amazing. So not only the advice, but actually the support. It's like, yeah, you go get that, you know? Yeah, give somebody to give you that like little G up, you know, you're not alone, you know, you don't have to do it on your, on your own. And so... <laughs> You've talked a lot about your journey, like your sort of your personal journey of overcoming your health challenges and, you know, sort of trying to find purpose and meaning in your work and your life. How has that affected the team that you've built? Because you said that you'd you'd lost two key members of staff and now you'd grown it to, is it 18 members of staff that you've got? Oh, there's just eight of us at the moment. Eight, yeah, sorry. growing quick, yeah. <laughs> Eight is still is still a good number. You've got from one to eight. Um, but yeah, so how, how have you found that your personal journey has influenced and engaged with your team as it is now yeah massively i think it's been a big part of it actually because through my feelings of the kind of work that i wanted to be doing and you know obviously it's a collaborative thing with jean she we've been on the same page 100 percent with this whole business journey we really decided that in effect we were going to re-recruit from scratch we we're going to build a new team up from scratch and this time the thing we interview about first is values, values-based recruitment. So 
So what kind of person is this? What, what gets them up in the morning? You know, yeah, of course, they need to be able to have the, skill, have the skills to do the job. But if they have the skills to do the job, but aren't the kind of person that we want, aren't excited about making an actual difference in the world, on um, well, four values, support, mastery, impact, and purpose. That's remote. So support, we want to be absolutely there for each other. We understand that failure isn't a thing. It's sometimes we try stuff and it doesn't work. And that's just another way of learning something not to do next time. No, it's we, the, the Edison thing. You know, I didn't, I didn't fail to make 999 light bulbs. I just worked out 999 ways not to build a light bulb until the thousands ones worked. And when you really embrace that, there's a sense of, it's not fearlessness as such, but it's a sense of, hey, you know what? We could try that and that might just work and that would be really exciting. And if we did this, we'd be really pushing the envelope. And that sense of, yeah, okay, you can do that. Just go up and do that. And I've got your back and who else can help him with that kind of thing? That sense of support really drives everything. And not just internally in the team, but we're there for our clients. You know, they, they know that there's a deeper relationship here. We're in it for the long haul. And we want to help them with that mastery we want to be learning we always want to be pushing slightly outside of our comfort zone okay i can't get docker installed on my computer does that mean i never use docker again no it means i keep on bashing work out how to install that local host ssl certificate so it'll work and all you know it's like constantly pushing whereas before i think it's like oh, that's just too complicated it's going to take too long i'm not going to do that uh, impact we really want to make a difference and when you when you know where you're headed when you actually know, not just to the end of this sprint, although that's important, but actually 10 years from now, we're going to be doing this, this, and this, and this. When the whole team is bought into that and knows why we're doing these things, then all of a sudden, the sense of momentum is massive. And the sense of excitement is massive. And I think that particularly the impact bit contributes massively to the startup vibe that we talked about earlier on. And then purpose. I need to know why. I need to know why you're doing what you're doing and I need to know why they're doing what they're doing and I need to know why I'm doing what I'm doing and not just in a, why are you doing that, but in a, really why? What's under that? So what happened in your childhood to make you feel that way? You know, you don't have to go with Freud on it, but you, but you do naturally when you really, when you really care, I suppose. And the meaning that floods from finding purpose is, is dramatic and astounding, really. I think my, my experience as well, like both personally and from working with others and building up teams is that when you have purpose, you work with purpose and meaning and you're happy in what you're doing, then you're much better at your job. You engage much more with others and everything just seems to flow much more nice, you know, much more nicely. It's an awful use of <laughs> um, everything just seems to flow much, much better, um, which kind of helps with that journey of, uh, you know, business acceleration. Because um, weirdly, when I started my business, I was thinking, you know, oh, I don't I don't want to build a team. I want to kind of, you know, have that lifestyle business and uh, do things on my own and, and everything else. And like, as I've gone through it, you know, I'm not even at the two year point yet, but I'm just like, you know what, I really want to build a team. I want to build something that's yeah. much bigger than just me. So yeah, I'm, I'm just yeah. getting going on that exciting journey, but it is everything that you're saying is all the things that I'm planning on putting into place. It's, it's awesome. And there are, I think, two other aspects to that. First of all, yes, flow, it's all about flow. It's all about finding that flow. And the way to get to flow is to, first of all, be in your lane and stay in your lane. Um, and secondly, to remove the obstacles that, that keep knocking you out of your lane. And mm. so, and that's the core of what I do for a living. That's, that, that's the core of it, is to map out all these processes with post-it notes to work out what is your absolute, how do you get, what is your customer journey from here to here? How does everything go from initial purchase order all the way through to delivery? How do you track that? How do you manage that? And now let's get the red post-it notes and slap on what are the pain points? What are the pain points? What's the problem here? And no matter how established the company, in fact, the more established the company, the more red stickers there are. Okay. And that's why when we're one or two people in our business, we manage and we might use Monday.com or we might use Basecamp, we might use Trello or whatever, and those systems work. When you get to a certain point, Generally, about five or six million pound turnover, 20, 25 employees, all of a sudden, those systems that carried you there, those Excel spreadsheets that got you to this point, they start to fall over 
And so the flow starts to ebb and it starts, into, starts to turn into grind. And so what we do is we step in at that point and we say, okay, how can we fix your flow? In fact, I've never said that, but I think I might say that in future. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how can we fix your flow? I like it. It's got a good ring to it. Yeah, definitely. And so it's this purpose thing. It's like, so what should you be doing and what are you actually doing? And so the are you actually doing stuff that isn't in your lane, what, how can we fix that? And so we look at every vertical slice in that step and we say, I'm sure we could automate that. I'm sure you, you don't need to receive this thing from email and forward it on to someone else. We can just upload it into a portal and let the person be notified by Slack or something like that. You know, there's always a solution to this. And the more that we can automate, the more we can take away these little tasks, the little tasks that don't seem like much, but build up and start to really push against that flow, the more we can do that, all of a sudden, we're not just bringing the team back to the pace that it should be, but we're elevating the team. Mm. That's, that's the theory of constraints right there. We're, we're removing the bottlenecks and we're creating that flow. And then you've got momentum and you haven't just got momentum, but you've got momentum in your lane. You've got momentum in the thing you were born to do. And mm -hmm. so you're making, by, by nature, I haven't yet found a purpose that isn't about the greater good. I haven't yet found a purpose that is self-centered. So if it's for me, if I think what I'm doing is for me, then I haven't dug deep enough yet. So I spoke to one of our team a while ago and he, he, he said, well, I just, I just like doing what I'm doing. I just, I just like it. And he was like, so it is self-centered. I just enjoy the work. And what we got down to it, he realized that when he did his best work, his clients he was doing that work for were delighted and he loved that feeling of making them happy. So actually, it was for the greater good. Yeah. He wanted people to be happy. He just wanted them to have his best work so that they could sort with the work that they were doing. And so that, that sense, you know, you're, you're making impact that way. Yeah, it's the power of asking good questions as well because I've found that a lot of people um, – have either they've never been in a situation that somebody else has asked them these questions that help them find that meaning or purpose or they'll settle with the point that they come across and that's why I always recommend either brainstorming with somebody else that's not directly involved in your business or just um, a friend or a coach or a mentor or somebody that can give you that extra perspective that little extra challenge or just ask those right questions that help you delve a little bit deeper um, because yeah it's one of those that sometimes because you're so stuck in it you can't see the wood from the trees and you just need somebody else to kind of shine a, a, a light at something that you're not quite familiar with. I think that's essential. I really do. I couldn't agree more because I know because I went for so many years without having that. But having someone, not even necessarily, although coaches are amazing, coaches that can ask the right questions are priceless. Um, but just having someone that, that gets you and gets the way that you think and gets what you want to achieve to just look at what you're doing and just ask, so is that definitely the, way, the only way it can be done? And mm. what other opportunities are there there? Just light bulbs explode. It's an amazing experience, yeah. Well, I could talk to you for absolutely ages about this topic, and I realise that time is running away from us. Um, but I think before we close, I just wanted to uh, mention, because you spoke to me about this before, that you're speaking again at, um, was it The Happiness Project? Yes, yeah, Spread the Happiness is a fantastic charity. What they do is they go into primary schools and they help teachers to show their children their real value. To, so at, at the primary school age, they're bringing joy into the classroom. They're teaching teachers how to bring joy into the classroom. And you know, I can't think of a more wonderful charity. So they, they, they have a happiness festival. So at the end of June, I'll be speaking at that. Uh, about all, all of the, the kind of stuff we've talked about, all about how technology isn't your enemy. Technology can be your friend. And, yeah, it, it might be replacing some jobs, but actually, it's, it's actually going to enable you to do the thing that you should be doing. You're going to be so much happier as a result. Um, 
Absolutely. And for anybody listening, like I've seen Paul speak. Paul is an absolutely amazing speaker. And I'm not just saying this because he featured DC comic characters in his presentation (laughs) Mm -hmm. and resonated with the the raving inner geek in me um, because, you know, DC wins for me every time over Marvel Comics. Yes. Any day. <laughs> Always get into this debate with people. But yeah, no, uh, Paul is an absolutely incredible speaker, very uh, engaging. So Thank I you. highly recommend going, seeking him out. But also because the Happiness Project, the charity is run by another absolutely incredible speaker. I know I'm repeating the word incredibly here, but literally I saw Shanette speak in February and I would put her up into like, you know, one of the top three most engaging presenters um i've ever seen she's absolutely phenomenal isn't she is she i presume she's speaking at this event as well absolutely yeah she's she's running the whole thing she's speaking she's she's an extraordinary person on so many levels and i agree she's she's so engaging because she's like she's so left of field she's like wow where did that come from (laughs) why is that woman on the stage dressed as an air hostess anyway and it's it's she's mind-blowing and she's yeah she's inspiring and yeah definitely so it, it was her that asked me to ask me to speak at this I, I can't wait to be part of that it's gonna be amazing oh it'd be amazing because yeah I'll share the the links and the information in the show notes so hopefully if you're listening to this soon uh you might still have the opportunity to go um but also you know just google um because you did a TEDx talk didn't you so that's on google yes so I can link yes. to that as well it's absolutely brilliant so check that out but then also check out Jeanette and the happiness project you will not regret it because I remember uh, I went to this event in February just tell you a quick story to wrap it up um went to this event that Paul was at in February this B1G1X event and um Jeanette was sat in the crowd dressed as an air hostess and my first thought because we all naturally judge it's really hard to avoid it was oh like somebody from Virgin Atlantic has come to the event and I wonder why they're sitting in the crowd and then later on in the day Jeanette gave this this incredible um very very engaging and uplifting presentation uh where she talks all about lemon suckers and um yeah just inspiring more happiness and purpose in schools and children and business as well it was brilliant it, it was brilliant because I think we all know, don't we? We all know that our lives should be lives of joy and meaning. It's like, we know this, but somehow we just find it so difficult. But I think um, what she shows and what we talk about and what's, you know, core to, to the work that we both do is, is that there is a way. And we, once you grab that, you just, you feel like you just want to shout and tell the whole world that. And it becomes our lives, right? Um, yeah. And you've only got one life. You only have one opportunity to live it. So if you're not doing something that lifts you up, uh, gives you a lot of joy uh, and a sense of meaning and purpose, then, um, you know, I hope that you've taken some inspiration from this podcast interview to uh, start having a look at other things that you could do. Or, you know, you know, Paul didn't have to change his business. He still had the same business. He just changed it in a way that gave him more purpose and meaning. So there's a lot that you can take from what Paul said here today. Um, so, if somebody wants to reach out to you, Paul, uh, get in touch and have a chat, what's the best way to contact you? So the business remote, we can we can be found on remote online. I've got a personal website, paulmcgilvery.com, which has my talks and some of my writing as well. Um, and very soon, my podcast, purposefirst.online. If you head there, you'll be able to check out that. Brilliant. And I will include... Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all that. Just search my name, <laughs> Paul McGilvery. It's, it's, there are many of us. I love it. And I will um, include all of these links in the show notes on my website, which is charliewyman.com forward slash podcast. Um, Especially if you're interested in B1G1 following uh, the interview last week or what Paul and I have been talking about as well, then just head to the B1G1 website, just b1g1.com. But again, I will link to that. Um, But yeah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Paul. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Charlie. I really appreciate it. It's been great fun. Cool. Cheers. Bye.